welcome to the local church. I'm Eric, one of the pastors here, and uh, I say this often, but maybe you're a guest and you can't tell uh, from looking at me, but I am Korean Cuban. That, thank you, appreciate that. That's my culture. Two different weird diametrically oppose cultures into one person, Korean and Cuban. And I'll admit, I don't know a whole lot about my culture, but, but, but what I've been experiencing, what I've seen from my culture is helping me uh, grow, is helping me understand myself better. Like, take for instance, I know one side of my culture is very quiet and very respectful, and they bow all the time and look you in the eyes, and, and the other side is very loud, I said it, Mickey Ming, like, you know, like, I get that. And this side of the culture, they talk really big with their hands. And this other side of the culture, they do taekwondo, so it's kind of like the same thing. It's just a lot of movement. Uh, but one thing that I found the same in both of my Cuban and my Korean culture is we both love rice. Come on, any rice lovers here? Love me some arroz, love me some bop. You know, put some beans on it, put some kimchi. It don't matter. I love me some rice. That's my culture. And culture is very important. Culture gives cues and defines this is who we are and this is how we do what we do. And culture isn't necessarily about proximity. It's, it's about affinity. Culture isn't so much passed down from where you are born, but it's more so about the people you're around and what they pass down to you. And it's so important for us to carry the right culture. And if we aren't intentional about carrying the right culture, what will happen is that the culture around us will begin to cause us to see as it sees. And in South Florida culture that is very pop culture driven, is very politically driven, we see all the things that the culture says is important. If we're not intentional, we begin to gravitate toward those things and desire those things, desire the prominence, the prestige, the, the, the influence, the wealth. And if we're not intentional of caring the culture, we'll find ourselves being something we didn't intend to be. So it's important for us as a church to carry the right culture to carry the culture of the kingdom of God. Because all the things that our secular, our worldly culture runs after, it's never going to leave us satisfied. All the likes, all the commas in your bank account, all the prestige, none of that will leave a soul satisfied. What the world wants, what the human heart really wants is something supernatural, something eternal, something significant. They, the heart the soul wants love. And you know who God has called to carry that, to give that away? Look around. Look around you right now. Us. You and me. The church. We are called to carry the culture of the kingdom of God. Over the next several weeks as we head towards Easter, we're going to be talking about the culture of the kingdom of God. We're going to be looking at a few chapters in the book of Acts and, and seeing the first church and the culture that they carried and tie that to where we are today in 2020 and how God wants us to live that out locally as the local church. And, and what would happen if, if all of us got it? What would happen if all of us carried the culture of the kingdom of God, if, if the, the community around us saw the love in the life of Jesus being lived through us and, and inside of us, what would happen? I'll tell you what will happen. We'll change the world. It will give hope to the hearts of people in our community. So we're going to talk about our DNA. We're going to talk about the culture of the kingdom of God and how that applies specifically to us in South Florida as a local church. And let me tell you, this is how we're going to change the world. Amen. So open up your apps, turn to the screen, open up your Bibles, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Here's the introduction of what we're reading. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Do you know what other book Luke wrote? What, what book? Luke. It's pretty self-evident, right? He wrote the book of Luke, and that was the prequel to the book of Acts. And in the book of Luke, he talked, like he just said, he talked about Jesus. He pointed to the life and the ministry of Jesus. And now in the sequel, in the book of Acts, what he's doing is he's talking about the history and the ministry and the culture of 
the kingdom of God, of the church. And early on in Luke and in Acts, he mentions this guy named Theophilus. That name literally means lover of God. And Theophilus was a very wealthy and affluent and successful businessman. And so Luke, Luke approached him and said, listen, Jesus came, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus resurrected, he ascended into heaven, and a lot of people saw him. But some of these witnesses are getting old and, and, and they're getting few and far in between. So we need a document. We, we need to get an eyewitness account of these people who have seen the life and the ministry of Jesus. And Theophilus agrees. And Theophilus, he bankrolls this whole entire organization and this whole entire engagement and so what we have in the book of Acts is not philosophy it's history and everything that Luke talks about points to Jesus and a side note that's what being a Christian is all about it's about the life and the love of Jesus living inside of us and living through us and so the first part of our culture here at the local church, the first thing I want you to write down is this. We start and end with Jesus. We start and we end with Jesus. It's always all about Jesus. He is the, the culture setter. He is the foundation the church is not about us. It's not about our desires. It's not about our preference. Eric Gamero doesn't call the shots in the church, amen? I'm not the alpha and the omega, but the, the person who is the beginning and the end and everything in between, his name is Jesus. He is the one that we should be looking to. And so as the church, we need to know what he wants, but thankfully, he's already told us. He's given us everything that we need to know right here in his scripture. And this isn't simply the best-selling book of all time. It's not ink on pages. This is living. This is active. This is powerful. This has the ability to transform people to look more like the image of God. He's given us everything that we need to know right here in this book. It's a love letter to us. He shows us and, and tells us how much he's done for us, how much he cares for us what he's willing to give to us because he's our heavenly father who loves us so much. It's a love letter, but, but it's also an instruction manual. The creator tells us how he's created us to live. He gives us the boundaries and the guidelines. He says, this is an instruction for you to live. Now, by show of hands, how many of us like to follow the instructions? Wow. Man, it's like less than a dozen of you. The rest of you are rule breakers. Right? Your rule breakers, man, perfect place for imperfect people. But the reason I ask that is because I need a volunteer. And the volunteer needs to be someone who follows the rules. So who wants to volunteer who's a rule follower? Let me see by show of hands. I'm going to ask you to come up here. All right, come on up. Come on up. You can walk up that way. While she is walking up, I, I want to let you know, all of you, I don't know if you can see this. This is an instruction manual. Okay? This is an instruction manual to how to create a Vedbo Ikea chair. Have you ever built a Vedbo Ikea chair? I have built several Ikea things, okay, actually. So you're a pro at this. Okay, so I have the instruction manual. And right here, this is the instruction manual of, of how to build the Vedbo. And right here, I have two fully completed Vedbo chairs. And I say that loosely because one of them was created and built following the instructions... And the other one was kind of like, ah, uh, whatever looks good, looks good. So here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to take a step of faith and to place your life onto one of these chairs. And, and by the way, here's the leftover pieces to one of them. Yeah, yeah, quite a few, quite a few. So go ahead, look at them, decide which one you're going to place your faith on. Now, for, for those of you right now, you're looking at, go ahead, inspect them, inspect them. You're looking right now, and uh, it, looks, it looks the same, right? You know, from a distance, it looks the same, but, but which one of these is the one that you're going to place your faith and put your life upon? All right, take, take a good inspection. Which one, which one? Sure, you can say that. I'm glad that wasn't in the microphone. <laughs> yeah, make fun of me. I'm so glad they're not here. They'd be like, oh, thank God you didn't say that in the mic, Mom. That would be an epic fail. All right, so we, we don't want an epic fail right now. Which one? Which one? Are you sure? No you, sh oh, you sure? No okay, all right. All right, let's see, let's see. Yes, give it up. All right. 
You chose correctly, and so your, your, your reward is, here's free breakfast on us. Can we give it up? Thank you. Give it up. If she would have picked the other one, uh, you would have sued us. So I'm so thankful that you did not. See, this is, this is how, de nada, muchacha. This is, this is how a lot of us live our lives. Our creator gave us an instruction manual of how he wants us to not simply build what our life looks like, but what our life will actually be able to support. And some of us, we don't follow the instructions. We build whatever feels good, and what's left over is something shoddy with poor workmanship that won't support the weight of your life. Some of us, perhaps even worse, is we start with the instruction manual, but we don't end with it. We just look and say, oh, this is what it's supposed to look like, and then we go from there. But we don't continue with the instruction manual. We don't end with the instruction manual. And so what we have is something that looks the same. It looks like it can support our life. But if we place the weight of our life upon it, it will crash. We have to start and end with Jesus. Both are equally important. Because just simply looking like everything is okay, it's so easy for us to, to give the appearance that, that it is built correctly, that it has followed the instruction, that it can support the weight of life upon it. We all have a picture of what the Christian life should look like, right? Maybe you've watched The Simpsons, and maybe for you it's Ned Flanders. You know, i got to wear a suit, i got to slick my hair to the side, whatever it may be. But it's not about the title. It's not about simply saying, I'm a Christian, look at how I look. It's what's on the inside. And so how do we change the inside? How do we, how do we change our thinking and our heart and our actions, not just the way we look? The answer is simply the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit inside of us so we can be who God's called us to be. Continues on, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And he presented himself alive. Say alive. alive. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells us that Jesus, after he resurrected, he showed himself to up to 500 people at a time so they can see and they can believe that he did resurrect. And this is important because Jesus is not dead. He's alive. If he was dead, our faith would be dead. Our hope would be dead. We would be dead, but Jesus is alive, and he continues on. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait. Say wait. wait. Say wait again. Wait. wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So everyone's excited. Jesus is alive. He resurrected. we got to go tell everyone about him. Jesus says, no, 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 hold on. Wait a minute. He said to them in Spanish, calmate muchachos. Like, you know what that means, right? All my familia, what does calmate muchacho mean? I mean, calm down, buddy. Calm down, friend. You want to learn it in Korean? You want to know how to say it in Korean? Chanka man chingus. Turn your neighbor and tell him that. Chanka man chingus. That means, hold on, friends. We want to go out. You're alive. He says, no, no, no. You need to wait. Before you go out, the Holy Spirit needs to come in. You need help. You can't do this on your own. Before you go out to tell the world, the Holy Spirit needs to come in to give you help. Here's the first big idea I want us to get. Being a Christian is not the life we live for God. It's a life that God lives in us. Again, it's not about the title. I'm a Christian. Look at my appearance. Look at my Jesus bumper sticker. It's not about the life we live for God. It's about the life that he lives in us and through us. It's the love of Jesus and the power of the Spirit of God living inside of us and through us. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So he tells them, I want you to wait. 
You need my spirit inside of you. You can't do it on your own. I need you to wait. The Holy Spirit needs to come in before you go out. Why was that so important? Because in Acts 1.6, immediately afterwards. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, it sounds like a simple question, doesn't it? But you need to understand the culture and the context of the world that they're living in. They, for many years, have been living under the oppression of a different empire. They've been mistreated. They have been enslaved. And now their leader, Jesus, did something that Caesar and no one else in all of history has ever done. He resurrected from the dead. And so they see this power and they're saying, are we done? Can you bring the kingdom? Are are you restoring Israel to its power? What they're really asking is, can you kill these Romans and rule over us? Can you take down the emperor and be our ruler? And if we're honest, a lot of us, we want the same thing from Jesus. We're wondering, are we done? Can you just come? Can you be the president of our country so that all this craziness will stop? Can, can, can you take all the politicians out of their place and get rid of them and give us some Chick-fil-A while we relax as you destroy our enemies? See, that's what a lot of us think. Are you done? Can I just walk into my boss's office and tell him hey, what I think about him because, because you're coming You need to understand, Jesus could have taken out everyone who was against him. He was God in the flesh. He could have sent lightning or locusts or given them, you know, some creative like IBS. Like just ruin their day. (laughs) Wipe them out completely. But he didn't. What did he do? He loved. He loved even his enemies. And he wanted his followers to do the same thing. Acts 1 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Listen, you don't need to know what's happening right now. I'm not going to tell you when the kingdom is coming back to earth, when, when I am going to rule like I said I would. But in the meantime, this season, I need you to bring the kingdom down. I need you to live out the culture of the kingdom while you're here on earth. Continues on, but you will receive power. Say power. power. Say it with power. Say power. power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Listen, look at the manual. Does your life look like that? Do you have power in your life? And don't get it twisted. What's the power for? It's not to put down our enemies. It's not to fight against people. It's to be a witness. It's to point people to Jesus, to show them with your life that you have been changed in such a way that you are no longer the same person you used to be because Jesus is inside of you and living through you through the power of his Holy Spirit. To be witnesses. You'll receive power to be witnesses. To show the world what Jesus has done. He literally gives us power that changes us and helps us to be a part of changing other people. Now, you guys already know this. I said it. I'm Cuban-Korean, okay? You got it? Cuban-Korean. Eric Gamero is my name. But for a long season of my life, I was spiritually Amish. Here's what I mean by that. If you've ever been to Pennsylvania, you know that it's a civilized community. You know that there is power accessible to all the people of Pennsylvania. But when you go to Amish country, although there is power accessible to them, they don't tap into that power. They try to live on their own. They try to to live life with their own strength and by their own hands and by their own wisdom. The power is available to them, but they choose to live in darkness by not tapping in to that power. 
Some of us, we're spiritually Amish right now. There is power available to you, believer, Christian. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of you from the day you surrendered your life to Jesus. And we still try to live life on our own. We still try to overcome sin on our own strength. We still try to be a good person on our own strength. And we can't do it. But there's power available. For every single one of us, there's power available. This is why we start and we end with Jesus. He's everything in between. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's who we look at as we walk forward. I want to let you in on a little secret, okay? I just want to put this out there just in case. In Jesus' name, I'll never happen. It'll never happen in my life. But the reality is, let me tell you this. I don't need the Holy Spirit to teach you guys on Sunday. What do you mean by that? Is this heresy? Listen, God's given me a gift. God has given all of us gifts. Every single one of us, he's given us spiritual gifts so we can point people to Jesus. And I'm aware that one of my spiritual gifts is teaching. Now, I'm not saying I'm God's gift to teaching. I have a lot of growing to do. I'm aware of that. But I know enough where I don't need the Holy Spirit. I can say all the right things. I can tell you a story in an emotional way. I can change the cadence and the levels of my voice to get all of you interested in what I have to say. We could put a, a video up on the screen and get the band to come out here and play real sad emotional music, like, like, a, like a sad puppy with only three legs. Like, you know, in the eyes of an angel. It's like, oh, I just want to give to the ASPCA. Like, these poor dogs. Look, we can manipulate everything so that you have an emotional experience. But can I tell you that no one will be transformed because of that? We need the Holy Spirit. He is the only one who can give someone eternal hope. He is the only one who can open up someone's eyes to their sin so that they would surrender their life to Jesus. So as a church, we start and we end with Jesus. We need him. It's all about him. And so we lean into him and his power because we want to point people to the only one who can save. His name is Jesus. Amen. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You will tell people and show people how I've changed your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, I can be a very good witness about all the new Apple products. Oh, I tell the gospel, the good news of Apple products. I can tell you good news of a restaurant that I found that has delicious tacos. Like, it's so good. But I'm praying, Holy Spirit, Give me power. Holy Spirit, give us power so we can point people to you. The only one. The only one who can satisfy our heart. The only one who can give us what we need. The only one who can save. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, don't miss what he's saying. He's not simply saying we start here and then we go out from there. He's not saying it's just right here in our local community and then we go global. He's also talking about the type of people. He's saying we start with people who look like us and we go out to those who don't look like us. We start with those who think like us and we have to go out to those who don't think like us. Because the good news is good news for all people. And all people matter to God. And so the culture of the kingdom dictates that all people should matter to us, period. Second thing I want us to get is we speak the good in everyone. Second piece of our culture is we speak the good in everyone. Everyone belongs. If you're a guest today, you belong here, even if you don't believe as we do. Because you matter to God and you matter to us. But we're not simply talking about just pointing people to Jesus. When we speak the good in everyone, we're talking about we see the good in people. And we sift that out of their life and we lift them up and we encourage people. We, we, we speak the good in everyone we see. Amen? Amen? Amen. See, I get it. It's hard to say amen to that because... The culture of the church for so long has done a terrible job of speaking the good in everyone. 
Like we love when people turn their life to Jesus, don't we? We celebrate that. We celebrate every number. And when someone is baptized, we stand to our feet. We cheer. We applaud. We high five. We hug them. We love when people surrender their life to Jesus. But after people have been set free from the judgment of sin, we love to judge them. We love to gossip about them. We love to talk bad about them. To share all the bad that we see in their lives. And when we do that, we become a poor witness of the good news of Jesus. Can I tell you that's not us? That's not who we are. We speak the good in everyone here at the local church. Now, I'm going to get real with you guys, and I don't want your permission because I love you. I want to be real with you guys, and I'm going to get in some of your dirty laundry, and some of you aren't going to like it, but, but you need to hear. This is not the words of Eric. This is the culture of the kingdom of God. You need to understand that as a church and as his people, we will never speak ill of a politician or a party. Ooh, no applaud to that, huh? It's real quiet in here. No, no, no. I don't want your pity applause. I know this is real. I know this is raw but they're so anti-us. And they don't stand for the things that we stand for. We should talk bad about them. We should promote our people. We should say they are wrong and they are sinful. But do you know that that politician is a person like you and me? That God loves so much that he sent his son Jesus to die so they could have eternal life. And so do you think that your political posting is going to get the people around us to see that Jesus is love? I'm going to get, I'm get deeper in your dirty laundry. All right, I'm going to make it real personal right now. I need you to know that as a church and as the people of God, we are never going to speak ill of another church or another pastor. See, I get it. Some of you used to go to that church and that pastor did something foolish or those people in that church hurt you in a way and so now you're no longer there and now you're here and you feel that it's right, that you have ammunition and you have the right to talk about how bad that church is. And maybe you do. I don't know what they've done. I'm not, I'm not minimizing the hurt and the pain that the people of God have caused other people. But here's what I am saying. This is the culture of the kingdom. This is the heart of the Father. You know what the church is? Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that the church is Jesus' bride. I don't care who you are. If you talk bad about my bride, we have issues. I love her. I've committed myself to my bride. And when you talk bad about my bride, you're talking bad about me because I chose her and I love her. I get it. The bride is sometimes stupid. Yes. The bride does some dumb things. The bride is imperfect. But Jesus still loves his bride. We're not going to put down the bride of Jesus We wonder why the world doesn't want to be Christian. But the world is wondering why we don't get along. Why we're always beating our own down. Jesus said this in John 13, 35. He said, the world is going to know that you belong to me. The world is going to know that you're my followers, not by the way that you vote, not by how well you can recite scripture, not by how you dress he says, the world is going to know that you're my followers when you have love for the rest of the brides. When you love other believers. Listen, if you're a guest here today, you're in a place that will never bash another Christian church. In fact, if you are a guest today, I hope you stop by our Connect Corner because we have a gift for you. And it's a bag. And in that bag, there's several things. And one of the things inside that bag is this card. It's up there on the screen. Listen, we are so proud to call ourselves the perfect place for imperfect people. 
We're all imperfect people. We all mess up. We all screw up. There's a perfect place for imperfect people. But this may not be the perfect church for you. And if it's not, no hard feelings. We've listed the names of some other churches in our local community. Some of them I know, some of them I don't know, but they're right here, uh, just a real quick drive. If this isn't the church, if this isn't the culture where you and your family think that you can grow and serve and give of your life, your time, your talent, your treasure, no hard feelings. We want you to go where that is because it's not about our name. It's not about our kingdom. It's about his kingdom. It's about the name of Jesus. So we speak the good in everyone. Now, let me make this abundantly clear. I'm not saying we ignore problems. I'm not saying when we see something, we lie about it or we turn a blind eye to it. We got to tell the truth. We got to be honest. Paul says it this way. Here's a culture of the kingdom of God. He says that we are to speak the truth in, in what? In love. We got to be honest. That's who God has called us to be, but we speak the truth in love. Some of you may have noticed that Pastor Steve wasn't here today. We like to give everyone on our team breaks periodically, and he's just put in so much hard work. And, and if I'm honest with you, I think his job is a lot harder than my job because all I have to do is come up here and, and share with you guys, and I meet with people periodically and give counseling. But, but Pastor Steve has to audition people. And some of these people, I don't know if they don't have an audio recorder or if they've ever seen American Idol. And so they come and they think they are God's gift to singing. And they sound terrible. And so Pastor Steve has a very tough job, but he speaks the truth in love. He doesn't say, wow, you sound like a bunch of cats in heat and I want to stick a pencil in my ear. That was terrible. No, he doesn't say that. But he wants to let them know that's not your gifting but, but I see that you do have a gifting in technology, and I'd love to connect you with our production team. Listen, if we have a friend that we care about, that we love, and we see them making a foolish mistake, don't ignore it, don't lie, don't turn a blind eye, because we love them, we speak the truth, but we start with love. Hey, man, I see what you're doing, and I'm not judging you, and I'm not going to push you away, but it's wrong, and I want to help. I want to walk, walk alongside. What can I do? Because how you treated your family and what you said and what you posted, that's not the kingdom of God. That's not the culture that we're supposed to carry. That's not the Father's hearts. But I'm here for you. I want to help you through this. We speak the good in everyone. And that's how we get better. Now, I'm not here to tell anyone how to parent, okay? I don't know how your culture parents, but I just know my culture. I know Korean and I know Cuban culture and how they parented. Now, my parents got divorced when I was younger, so I live with my, my Cuban side of the family, with my dad, my abuelo, and my abuela. And how they parented me was by using the chancleta or taking off the belt or using, you know, the, 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 the rice spoon to, to hit my palms. And my abuela, she would encourage me by saying things like, mira, chino cochino, like, clean your bathroom. What's wrong with you, sucio, like, you dirty Chinese pig. That's, that's what my grandma, she knew I was Korean, but she called me a chino kochi. She called me a Chinese pig. And I turned out okay, okay? I think, I think I turned out okay. I still go to counseling. So I'm not, I'm not saying how you should parent. It works sometimes. But can I, can I just suggest something else? Words of affirmation. To let people know what you see in them, the good, to lift them up, to encourage. Here's a second point that I want us to get today. Love brings out the best in others by speaking the best in others. Love brings out the best in others by speaking the best in others. You, you want to see transformation? Speak the good. Speak the best in love. That will, that will bring the good to the top. In fact, let us try that right now. If you're with someone you know, you don't have to love them. If you're with someone you know, just look at them right now and just begin to speak the good in them. Bring out the best. Tell them what you see. You can't think of something? Just say, you are really beautiful, you're really handsome, and I'm glad you're sitting by me today. <laughs> we 
What's up, Landon? Hey, Landon, I see your heart for our students. And you work a difficult job and you work crazy hours, but the fact that you come and you serve them and you pray for them with everything that you got going on, brother, you got this. You're doing so well. Love you, man. How's it going, Michelle? I know you probably said great and you don't mean it because I know you work so hard to provide for your family. I know God's given you great ideas and you've seen him come through and you've seen him take you through a waiting process, but you are such an encouragement. Your smile and your testimonies of life, they give so much life to me and you got this, Michelle. John. Love you, my brother. And the example that you set serving your wife in her sickness, that has transformed so many people that you don't even know about. And I know you've been such an incredible father to your kids. Their life is your legacy. With everything going on, you got this. He's with you. Thank you for your example. And um, I know that, uh, Heather, you're watching online all the way from Washington State. And I know you think that um, you're just a potty mouth idiot. But I see the fruit. I see the transformation. I see what he's doing in your heart. And you have so much worth. You have so much beauty. He loves you so much. You got this. Continue on with it. This is the culture of the kingdom. This is who we are at the church. This is what we carry. We speak the good in everyone. Acts 1.9. It says, and when they had said these things, when he had said these things, they were looking on. And he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven? This Jesus who was taken up for you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. I, I told you this last week, I love taking the word of God and trying to picture it because this really happened. This isn't fiction. This is history. This is life. This is kingdom. They're there, and Jesus spoke these things. You're going to have power to be my witnesses. I'm giving you my gift, my help for the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And then he got lifted up, and he ascended into heaven. And the disciples, they're like, just staring. They're gazing up into the sky. Like so many of us. We're just waiting. When are you going to bring the kingdom? When are you going to lead over us? When are you going to set us free from this political madness? When are you going to set us free from all this violence and racism? When are you coming? And we're just gazing up into heaven. And the angels, they say, guys, what are you doing? Jesus, he's coming back again. Yeah, but when? I don't know. Neither does he. But you got to get out of here. What do we do? Tell people about Jesus. Tell them what you saw. Tell them how your life is transformed. Tell them how you don't hate your enemies anymore. Tell them how you're still getting through the difficulty, but you have hope. Go out. We can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? We're just stupid fishermen. We're just tax collectors. We, we, we've been sinful people, but he's given you his Holy Spirit, so you got this. Go. Say this with me. Say, stop gazing up. Start going out. You got this. Stop gazing up. Stop waiting for something just to happen. Go out. Just go out. He's given you his Holy Spirit. He's given you power to be a witness. You got this. And from these 11 disciples to a church of 120 people to the rest of history, it has been tremendously transformed. How? How has Jesus' name affected everything in our history as mankind? Because of people who carried the culture of the kingdom of God. 
And I believe that that first church that changed the world is the same church that's here today. We can bring hope and healing and life to our local community, but it starts right here, right now, with you. And with you. With you. With you. It starts with us. Jamila Kenneth, with, with you guys. David, with you. It starts right here. Will we carry the culture? Will we live out the DNA that God has put inside his people through his Holy Spirit? If we do, we'll see change and transformation. Do you believe that? Would you stand to your feet right now? We started with Jesus, with worship. We're going to end with Jesus, with worship. We're going to sing a song of praise, believing the best is still before us. But I want you to start speaking the good in yourself right now. As we sing this song, believe that you are chosen. He selected you. He's for you. You're, you're not cast aside. You are his beloved. You are his child. You are filled with his Holy Spirit. And the best is still before us. Amen. Let's believe it. Let's sing it. In Jesus' name.